and how it can be made. I think it's also limiting the new voices into the public art world. So public art has always been about and should be about connections, social and community connections, environment, site issues, culture, history, geography. We can name a huge number of them. And also making the connection with art. And it's important to keep all of this in balance, but art and artists must be at the core and must be in the lead. People may think that anyone with an aesthetic penchant, a design experience, or is arty, might be able to make, choose, or plan public art. But actually, I say no. It is artists who should make and lead where the public art field goes, and people who are well-versed in contemporary art world as a whole should be the ones who oversee and manage it. Public art is not just about how it looks, or how it's constructed, but it's about how it adds to the environment and adds to the conversation and the meaning of the places it inhabits. We call it art also for a reason. We do need to broaden the field, not by lowering the art quotient in public art, but by increasing the breadth of what the art is saying and doing. But we also should not forget that much of how we started is still really valid. Let's not just throw away what we've been doing. We need to increase our knowledge of art and knowledge of art in our audiences as well, not shirk from it. And I fear sometimes that our field is kind of moving away from that. We need to be able to distinguish the good art from the bad, the derivative from the genuine expression. We need to be able to admit when a piece is not successful to also recognize a really good idea if it's new and we have never heard of it before. Our art training, background, and knowledge will really help guide us in this effort. And we need to allow the artists to lead and continue to shape the field in fundamental ways and not to have artists fit a certain mold or fit the scope of the project. We do call it public art because fundamentally, the public is also part of the conversation in how the art will live in the world. Just putting out art outdoors in a park or a plaza is not necessarily public art. Public art takes into consideration so much more. So the other thing is our field is not just about the who. It's also about the where. We need to recognize the new spaces for public art as we look into the future. We need to recognize the new methodologies and technologies to bring art into our known and yet to be known public spaces. We need to let art literacy and art intelligence be first, in addition to being savvy about community, site, and audience. And it's those last elements that will plow the field, but it's the artist that will seed it. Thank you. I just want to add this one, whoops, one last, whoops, wrong way. Wait, I'm having trouble. Am I doing it wrong? I had a funny little photo that I wanted to end with, really. <laughs> this is for our duking it out in the next round. Hello. Oh. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Jason Seng. I'm the Community Engagement Specialist for Fractured Atlas. And um, Fractured Atlas is a nonprofit technology company that works with artists and helps them with the business side of their creative work. And um, the topic of this discussion really interested me because so much of the work of Fractured Atlas is really essentially about transforming the status quo of the field. Um, 
And Fracture Atlas does this through many different lenses. And the lens that I particularly ap approach this work is specifically a social justice lens. So I'm really interested in tackling this topic from the micro and the macro level because I think they're, they're really linked to each other. So let's get started. Um, so, uh, to, so to transform the field, we first must un understand what the field is. So when, we, when I talk about the field, I, um, I'm talking not just about the traditional disciplines of theater, dance, music, art, visual art. It includes things like fashion, uh, design, and uh, video games. Um, it's not just nonprofit institutions. It includes individual artists, sponsored projects, uh, for-profits, folk traditions, and consumers. Um, we're also seeing a proliferation of platforms, and increasingly the, the distinction between audience and creator are becoming blurred. Um, the arts are not a monolithic entity. That's not one art czar or Wizard of Oz who's pulling all of the strings. Um, however, it is emphatically a system. And like all social systems, it is created and recreated by an infinite number of hyper-local, tiny choices and actions. And oftentimes, the forces that we're dealing with play out at the micro level with very little intentionality or malice, but when magnified over an entire sector, have hyper-macro consequences. Um, and like all social systems, it does not operate in a vacuum. Um, the arts and culture system is enmeshed with our, within our broader society and economy. Um, so if we live in a society that we understand to be racist, sexist, heterosexist, ableist, colonialist, or otherwise hegemonically oppressive, which is the preferred term that I use, um, then it would, it would fall to reason that the arts and culture system will instinctively reproduce the same oppressions of, of the society with which it is entangled. So to demonstrate, throw a whole bunch of statistics at you, so please don't fall asleep, I promise it'll be worth it. So this is the, distribu the distribution of wealth in America. This is the distribution of contributed income in the US arts and culture sector. Does it look familiar? In 2015, researchers found that 3% of all uh, of the, 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 the richest 3% of Americans now own 54% of all US wealth. Meanwhile, in the arts, the largest 3% of arts and culture organizations by budget size receive over 60% of all arts and culture funding, um, or rather contributed income. So we can see that our field is unequally resourced. Um, and, this, and hegemonic oppression worsens this resource gap. We can see this in society where um, white households median wealth is about 10 times larger than uh, that of, of Latino or Latina households and about 13 times larger than that of black households. Um, we kind of know about the gender wage gap, but that gap, when it's spread out over racial um, lines, is much more exacerbated for um, brown and black women. Um, this is, again, repeated in the arts, where only 10% of U.S. arts and culture grant dollars benefited vulnerable populations, um, while the U.S. is 40% people of color. This research is, again, coming from Holly Sidford's research. Um, and again, reproduce at the local level. Um, the Calif of, of California arts and culture funding, only 9% benefited communities of color, and California is 60% people of color. That just boggles my mind. Um, and so this oppression-inflated resource gap fundamentally inhibits our ability to participate in society. So we see this in socioeconomic statistics where a person with a disability is twice as likely to be unemployed as a person without. Similarly, a black person is twice as likely to be unemployed as a white person. Um, of the Fortune 500 CEOs, 90% of them are white men. Only 5% are white women, and only 1% of Fortune 500 CEOs are black. Five. Again, this is, we see this repeated in the art sector, where 5% of US art museum directors are people of color. Um, among local arts agency employees, 86% are white. 72% um, 72, 72 are women, um, which is great. But before we pat ourselves on the back, um, I think we can also talk about the challenges of being in a feminized industry and, with that, um, and the reper repercussions it has on things like um, wage depression. Um, Almost eight out of 10 roles on New York City stages were performed by white actors. And New York is only one in three non-Hispanic white. So as we can, oh, and one more. Uh, US orchestra players um, are only 4% black or Latino. 
Um, so we can see that this fundamentally impacts who shows up, who participates, and who leads our arts organizations. So how did we get here? This quote from Theodore Roosevelt, of all forms of tyranny, the least attractive and most vulgar is the tyranny of mere wealth, the tyranny of plutocracy. Um, I bring up Teddy Roosevelt because he was staunchly opposed to the reach and power of the wealthy and actively used the government to protect public assets from the private sector. The most notable of, such were of his was the establishment of the national park system. And I bring this up because so many of the roots of the inequity that we see in our field dates back and precedes the progressive era of Theodore Roosevelt. Um, so we have the resources and power in the arts, which have been concentrated in an incredibly small number of gatekeepers who are disproportionately representing the interests and the, the demographics of the hegemonic class, which we can read as white, wealthy, able-bodied, heterosexual, etc. cetera. Um, and this is largely by design. The traditional arts infrastructure was created by the wealthy and historically has catered towards their tastes and needs, which um, was primarily concerned with preserving the Western cultural canon. Um, and as the government has ceded more and more responsibility to philanthropy and the social sector, the influence of, of these gatekeepers has increased. Artists in marginalized communities are only able to tap into this resource system by appealing to and maintaining uh, the cultural status quo, which does not question or disrupt the hegemonic culture. Um, many call this cycle the nonprofit industrial complex. I say that we can call it the arts industrial complex to give it some more flavor. So where are we headed? This is a great quote by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Doesn't it get better, Jason? Um, so many people in our, in our society believe that our, our, our society is inherently progressive, and that as over time, as time passes, we grow more equitable. But does it really? Nathan Silver's blog, 538, shows us that the more diverse our cities become, the more segregated they are. Um, the Washington Post found that white millennials are just as racist as older generations when asked questions like, are blacks lazier than whites? Or are blacks less intelligent than whites? White millennials respond almost as the same as their forebears. In 20, by 2016, Oxfam predicts that the world's 1% wealthiest people will have more wealth than the entire global population. So, the, point, the reason why I, I, I bring this up is because so many of our metrics are pointing to a world that we're going to be living in that is more segregated, more divisive, and more unequal. So what hope do we have? So let's talk about what we know. So we know that our arts and culture system is fundamentally flawed. A report came out of the, uh, out of the United Kingdom earlier this year that caused things fundamentally changed with the uh, way that the arts operate and it's in, in interface with the public, that we are approaching a cultural apartheid. So these forces are deeply entrenched in our systems, uh, and yet they're highly dispersed, so it's very difficult to assign blame or to target a single person or entity. Um, I want to bring in this quote by Audre Lorde, who's like my fave. Um, for the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. I bring this up because so many of the solutions that I hear about um, in, when we talk about this subject are um, starting with the base assumptions of this arts industrial complex. And I want Audre Lorde to remind us that our liberation will not be found in the status quo. So we can see this that, you know, the funders can't save us. Let's be honest about that. Um, foundation funding only accounts for about 14% of contributed income. Uh, and when we look at that much bigger chunk of individual giving, we can see that the wealthy are largely abandoning us. Um, over time, uh, the wealthy's uh, share of their income has decreased as the middle class and the poor are digging deeper into their pockets. So, however, I have hope, we exist at a unprecedented moment in history innovation and disruption is rapidly accelerating. Um, the economist Joseph Schumpeter calls innovation creative destruction, the process of industrial mutation that incessantly revolutionizes the economic structure from within, incessantly destroying the old one, incessantly creating a new one. So what is this disruptive technology that we're talking about? It's allowing things like disintermediation, which is connecting fans directly with creators. Um, so 
Open platforms like YouTube, VHX, On the Boards TV, and other new trends like crowdfunding are simultaneously making it easier for arts makers and culture makers to find, connect, engage, and cultivate their fans. We're also seeing a falling barrier of entry. Um, Bill Janeway, who is a venture capitalist and economist, talks about how open source software combined with cloud computing is uh, reducing the cost and time of the, the cost of time and money it takes to launch a new service in our new kind of web-based economy, and that it's um, approaching asymptotically to zero. Um, so a lot of what Fractured Atlas does is to help reduce the startup costs to help more creators enter the arts and enter the market. But really, we need to be doing a lot more of that and at scale. Um, and then generally, we need to be moving more from an institution-centered system to a person-centered institution. Uh, person-centered system, rather, sorry. So this means a fundamental shift towards the DIY artist and self-production and self-management. Um, however, fixing the market is not enough. Even if we solve all the market barriers, we will not solve the inequity problem in the arts without also attacking the root cause of this injustice in our society, hegemonic cultural oppression. But this is where the arts in its content can be a major player in debunking the hegemonic beliefs which keep vulnerable people marginalized. Um, earlier this year, Norman Lear gave a, an amazing speech on the role um, of using arts to combat racism, sexism, homophobia, and to further progressive politics at Arts Advocacy Day. So we must um, embrace an arts policy strategy that is person-focused. When I say person-focused, I don't mean individual focus. Well, maybe a little bit of that. But I mean uh, focusing um, on uh, people as whole people. Um, so by focusing on art-specific issues, we erase the experiences and the challenges that are experienced by the most marginalized in our field. So we must understand that our oppression, while not identical, are all linked to each other, and that our art politic must be rooted in solidarity. I'm going to finish with, um, I recently saw the 2014 film Pride, which is a, a film about a group of gay and lesbian activists in the 1980s in the United Kingdom who organized in support of striking mining communities in Wales. Um, and the film began and ended with a protest song whose only lyric was solidarity forever. So solidarity forever. A grantee once told me that transformation is one of those bullshit funder terms that we use that everyone then has to fall in line for. Why, I asked him, don't you believe that thoughtful, real change can happen if you design new ways for your organization to function? And he told me that real change that he needs has a dollar sign and many zeros behind it. <laughs> And that's Bob Graves from the Old Town School of Folk Music, who many of you will see tomorrow. But Bob got me thinking, is transformation just a term we use? Is that really possible? I know that as an individual, most of us have transformed ourselves at least once in our lifetime, if not several times. I've known organizations that may not have gone from point A to point Z, but have certainly gone from point A to point B, and then maybe moved to point C. So what would lead to many people and many organizations changing so as to justify what could be called field-wide transformation that would help organizations look like our changing nation? What are the major levers that it would take to get us there? As Clay mentioned, I'm Angelique Power. I'm from the Joyce Foundation, which is based here in Chi-Town. Welcome, welcome to our city. Chicagoans, stand up. Who are Chicagoans in the crowd? Yes, yeah. John, yes, yes, yes. If there's a problem, talk to the people that just stood up. <laughs> responsible for that. Um, we are primarily a policy foundation. We focus on quality of life in the Great Lakes region which means we tackle issues like education reform, environmental protection, we work to help the low-wage worker have upward mobility, and we take on issues like gun violence prevention. 
The culture program doesn't focus on policy like the other areas, but it looks to also level the playing field by focusing on where we see inequity, and that's racial equity in the arts. Prior to Joyce, I ran communications and community engagement at the Museum of Contemporary Art, where we will be boogieing down collectively on Friday evening at the opening reception of the full AFTA conference. And before the MCA, I was in community relations at Target Corporation. And I tell you this not to bore you with my resume, but to let you know that I do believe in fieldwide transformation, probably because I've spent time inside of a corporation, inside of a nonprofit art space, and I'm now functioning in a private foundation. So I believe in two main levers, and they've kind of run through all of the presentations today, but I'll be sort of the bold italic underline. One lever, I think, is realizing that many of our arts organizations are not designed to be equitable, diverse spaces. Now, some of our finest and most important arts organizations are set in communities of color. They do not struggle with representing the demographics around them, on their staff, on their boards, on their stages, and in their galleries. They struggle, as we've mentioned, with not receiving the same level of funding that those white arts organizations receive to bring in that diverse constituency. And I'll get back to that shortly. But let's focus on the white organizations that are certainly struggling to keep up with the changing demographics on their staff, board, and on their stages. Despite best of intentions of those art spaces leaders today, our arts organizations reflect the widespread inequities that are baked into the systems, just like it's baked into housing systems, education systems, criminal justice systems. Whether it's the culture of the organization, the policies, programs, they are slanted so that the results that are happening that have been detailed today, they are actually getting the right outcomes that they are designed to achieve. Without a systemic intervention, progress will not be made. And what better time to do this? Let's look at the past year. Ferguson, Eric Garner, Black Lives Matter, teenagers at a pool party in Texas. Now let's look at the arts. And I think that each of us have mentioned this disparity that 2% of arts organizations receive 55% of the funding. We were shocked in the last two presidential campaigns that 88% of the Republican Party was white. But then we look at the numbers of arts organizations administrators and they're the same. Or we look at the executive directors and they are 90 plus percent Caucasian. The New York Times wrote an article that said, you have to be white and male to be an artist making a living today due to the fact that most financially successful artists are. There's a group of organizations and funders within grant makers in the arts a national organization that I'm honored to serve on the board of with several of you that are in this room. And we've been working steadfastly on shining a light on demographics, sure, but also on how structural inequities are baked into the DNA of our art spaces. And if we want spaces that reflect communities, we need these structural interventions. We need to look at root causes, re-examine policies and procedures, so that we can make sure that the people who run the organization, the people who have the best of intentions, can get the outcomes that they want, which are organizations that are magnets for all people to the stages, galleries, boards, and offices. Also, many of us here in Chicago, art executive directors and artistic directors from a wide range of arts organizations, from Steppenwolf to Black Ensemble Theater, Joffrey Ballet to Muntu Dance. We've just emerged from a two and a half day anti-racism training with the People's Institute of Survival and Beyond. How many people know of the People's Institute? How many people have been to a training? Okay. This was not something that was funded by the Joyce Foundation. 
In fact, each of the arts organizations paid money out of their own organization's budget, and some wrote personal checks to cover the cost. We all came to realize that for transformative change, we need to move out of the transactional realm of just adding a few people to the pipeline and feeling good. We need to change the culture, the way we relate and honor our constituents, along with changing the policies and programs and people that are in place. And these systemic changes are made, especially need to happen at foundations. We need to be held accountable to how we change our funding, the way we fund, who we fund, how we measure success, how we're beholden to the entire art ecology. Number two, that was just one, <laughs> number two. Human capital development. People are essential to the success of arts organizations, and yet anyone who's worked inside of an arts organization can tell you that there is little, if no focus on people not on job training or professional development, no cultivation of middle management to be great leaders, people are doing two to three jobs. The tenor is always set to 11 with people running a marathon in a sprint. And don't get me started on salaries. I call entry-level positions in the arts indentured servitude. And management or leadership don't fare much better. Last week, MoMA employees started to picket due to that museum with an endowment nearing $1 billion asking the employees to increase the amount they pay for health insurance on top of their already low wages. Robust retirement planning is also tough to come by, making founder syndrome less of a choice of a founder who just won't let go of their organization and more of a reality of a founder who cannot afford to retire. What if the arts treated its people like some of the smarter companies do? What if funders gave dollars to cover salaries and insisted that they raise them? Ultimately, what if we decided that we wanted to inject the same creativity we do to the front of the house, to the back of the house, pay a competitive wage to every level inside of an arts organization, train people on the job not once, but always, because there's always innovations coming down the pike. That way, we can attract all different kinds of people to the arts, not just the usual suspects. So to wrap, I think that transformation is possible when we understand how systems are designed for these undesired outcomes, and so we change those systems. When we see the arts are only as strong as all the people that help to create it behind the scenes and start investing like mad in human capital and when funders support this work honestly and wholeheartedly. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Well, that, that was a lot. <laughs> um, I think one of the things that for me is, is the thing that I'm going to reflect on most coming out of these four presentations and all of the other conversations that I know we're all having about this is, um, is in some ways the enormity and complexity of what we're talking about. And I think that that is often um, the case uh, in lots of different systems. It's certainly the case when you start talking about um, diversity or equity for example, and, um, and, and spinning up from one individual's experience to an organization, to a system, to a society, to the world, and suddenly it becomes very hard to figure out how to move against an inertia from an object that size. So um, I'm just going to ask you guys one question, and then I want to throw it out to the audience because we do still want to try and get you guys out by 6.30. But my question is, um, not a small one, uh, if you had to pick one thing for us to start with, to take one step um, in terms of transforming our field, however you want to identify that, um, what would that one step be? Because I think that, that often um, we get stymied by figuring out where we want to walk first, and so we don't move. And then we get tired of this subject and we move on to another one, and we don't want to do that. So um, I'm going to start with James, go this way. <laughs> <laughs> or should I start? No, James has had the longest to think. He talked first. It's fine. <laughs> I don't know. It's an interesting thing. I mean, 
I really believe in the live experience. So while I appreciate everything, Jason, you were saying about the digital and all that and what that means, and I agree with it, I also really believe in this idea of like collective effervescence. Like something magical can happen when people are together. Um, and so I, I really do believe in the live experience. Um, I think there's a big challenge that you kind of referenced is like, and you know, one of our one of our convenings, um, Hadari Davis talked about. Hadari Davis, and you know, m many of us our age grew up in segregated public schools. Oh, excuse me, integrated public schools, and now the schools have become more segregated. Right? There's a resegregation happening, particularly in urban landscapes. Um, and so, what does that mean? So, Hadari is a curator. Integration and sort of multi-ethnicity and plurality is just in his DNA. Um, and so what is that going to mean 30 years from now when the kids who are in high schools right now that are being retrenched, segregated, what's that going to mean for their artistic curation? So to me, it goes back to, as adults, I think we have to be conscious about creating, safe spa creating spaces in which younger people can thrive. And so what is it, when I talk about like changing leadership landscape, I'm talking about what is it we're doing now that is going to have resonance 30 years from now so that the young people who are in leadership positions and are pulling the levers both reflect the demographics of the country properly at the time, but also are set up based on the actions we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. And that those reverberations last and aren't necessarily recognized often until 30, 40 years down the road. Okay. okay. So that's not an answer, but that's what I want to say. Well, no, I, I, think, <laughs> I think it is an answer. I think, um, I think it, it would be interesting given that context. And, and I think one of the things that was most marked between the two of you, and I don't know, Nori, if you're going to go this direction or not, is that um, a lot of what, what, James, you were talking about had to do with the, the kind of complexities of being an artist and being an artist in, in a set of, um, art, art is so, um, trans, I guess, transformational over time. So, you know, you are the hip hop generation that came with a whole set of things, none of which really prepared you to move into a system that was created for a generation 20 years before. You're now dealing with, with people who don't connect with that same set of influences. And yet, I think, Nori, mm. as you were saying, it's, it's important to place the artist at the center um, if we are to talk about our field as the arts field. So, Nori, I'd love to hear, what, what, is, what is your first step? <laughs> I actually kind of resist the idea of a single first step. Because I think that there's so much um, variation in the field that I don't think there is a single step that really makes sense for mm -hmm. everybody to take. And so um, I guess my um, thing would, well, what I would hope is that there would be um, within each whatever, some way where artists really do become fundamentally part of trying to create what that system is. Because I know that when in Seattle, for instance, when we started the public art program there, that, we, that you know, being an artist involved at the level of the commission and being there trying to help um, design what the program could be, in some ways, I think that made a difference to the people who weren't artists. Mm -hmm. And that um, there's something about new fields that where the bar to entry is a lot lower. And, um, you know, I've just been around, I've seen, uh, for instance, you know, when I was younger, I worked a lot in video art. And video art was not considered a high art like painting, right? And it, for women and for you know, people of color, whatever, different voices, painting was kind of hard to get into in some ways. But video art was a lot easier because it wasn't within the kind of big super system. And so I think there is something also really valuable for each um, generation or each group to also create their own yeah. systems and to kind of move into these ways that aren't like the Museum of Modern Art or the symphony or, you know, because um, we may be really knocking on doors that are just impossible to open. And that's a lot of energy that could be spent doing something new. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of believe that we need to kind of think about that. Like, can we spend our energy not trying to break down the walls, but to create a system that is that kind of inclusive thing that will uh, that has that so-called um, 
open door right. that isn't so hard to get into. Yeah, I, I, I once had someone tell me that, that they thought that radicalism was the purview of the young. And as people get older, they become more interested in the systems because that's where they are in their, in their pathway. And I, that, that's interesting to me. And I, I wonder if in that context, um, if you're talking about blowing up a system, if you're talking about creative destruction, for example, um, th that's an interesting thing to throw out there. But you're saying it in, in the larger context of you know, the, the hegemonic oppression that you're talking about, which has lasted centuries. So, so in that context, I'd love to know what, what you, Jason, think is, is kind of a first step. Yeah, so I don't think that there is, again, a single first step. Um, but I also think that we all should be taking first steps. Um, but there's something we, we talk about a lot about um, at Fractured Atlas, about the ways um, in which we kind of, how we make decisions um, is being directionally correct. We know that we don't have perfect information. We know we are probably not going to get exactly where we want to be. But if we can, if we can eliminate the places that we don't want to be, we can move towards better. So I think we all need to be making many tiny little chips um, and see what works and see what doesn't work. Um, but my personal uh, uh, small thing, and this, this is not something that I don't think will, will fix everything, but I want to see an end to unpaid internships. I think they're an affront to like everything that we hold dear. And I think it speaks, large, uh, it speaks to a larger issue about how we value um, uh, artists and the people who create the content. Um, much of kind of what, what we see in how the arts industrial complex operates it, um, arts organizations or nonprofit institutions have you know, largely been encouraged to emulate our uh, corporate or capitalist counterparts in the private sector. Um, and the easiest way to maximize profits is to externalize your costs. And I see that in the arts sector. Um, and those costs are being borne out on the artists. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. What about you, Angelique? I don't think it's that complicated. I think that, you know, we are in this moment, this sort of civil rights moment, and that it is our obligation to unpack race, to unpack white culture, and to call it that, to name it, to not, to sort of move away from coded language around quality and excellence and rigor. Um, uh, Roberta and Rod Joy, I think, gave a fantastic beginning to the cultural equity pre-conference. And that's, I think, our obligation, all of us, as we move into our spaces to sort of question the status quo, question the curatorial prowess and decisions that we've just always sort of accepted as fact and allowed there to be this divide in our arts community. You know, we need each other. We're interconnected. We, we define this art moment. Artists have led plenty of movements. The country is a mess right now, trying to figure out how to talk about race, how to unpack it, how to tackle structural racism. The arts, we are here to lead the way forward. So I think, I think that's first. That's awesome. Sure, go ahead. So I just want to say, to me, there's urgency. I think there's a particular urgency right now um, in that you know, young people are going to make art. That's an inherent human need, right, to express yourself. And they're looking for all kinds of different ways to do it. If we're talking about the field, the nonprofit arts field, we're in danger of losing an entire generation that's not going to buy into and, and take part in a totally broken system. And so that goes back to, like, if we believe in the f not, you know, for all the structural problems of the 501c3 financial model, which we all know sucks, are we willing to lose an entire generation of people who actually are the folks we really want to sort of bring vitality to the field? Because they're going to keep making art, they're just going to do it elsewhere. And they're not going to buy into all the financial constraints and lack of opportunity and lack of leadership things that many of us have for generations. Right. Well, and let me just ask you really quickly and then um, be thinking of your questions and raise your hand and there'll be a mic coming your way. Is that a problem? If, if, and I don't mean, is that a problem if we lose a generation? I think it's a problem and I'll go right back to the Audrey Lord thing. It's like, we, do, we, do we want, okay, so like I, re again, I've been raising money for, 50, for 20 years, and so I, I've been and I've been to all those nonprofit finance fund trainings, and like I, the structural financial problems in the non 501c3 world are real. But capitalism is worse 
and like for profit. Like I don't, I don't love the idea of, re I don't love this idea of social venture capitalism and all this different kind of stuff where the double bottom line of I'm gonna make a million dollars and I'm gonna do social good. I think there needs to be a place where the primary focus is not monetary, but you don't have to be broke to do it. You don't have to, you don't have to be, we're not here to be ballers, but we don't need to s struggle. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so that's the thing. Like, I, I believe in that. Like, I'm not sure that's the 501c3 system as we know it, but I believe in that idea. Does anyone have a, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I think that there really was, I know that in the 70s when I was working at nonprofit. Um, arts organizations, that there really was this push by funders to be a business. And I think that there's the same kind of push for artists now in the public art field too, to be a business. And I don't think business is the right model. And you know, we're really, we need to change that. And I think, um, and it was even like the NEA for instance, they were asking the same thing. And I think asking the, the wrong questions about success being, you know, how many audience people did you bring in? And which has nothing to do with the value of an event. I mean, if you can change one life, that's valuable. But if you write, I changed one life on the grant application report, <laughs> they would be like, sorry, next time, you know, forget it. Is, so but, let, me, let me just push back on that for a second. It, it, uh, understanding that, um, understanding the intrinsic value of art, and I, I strongly believe in the intrinsic value of art, and um, the, the, the process of trying to measure that and, and define that is something that I think is a, is a worthy pursuit. I also think that it is very hard to juxtapose um, th this idea that as, as nonprofits that are there for the public good, if you're talking about that part of the field mm -hmm. at least. Um, you need to be creating work that is for enough people to justify the fact that you're not paying taxes and you get all sorts of other things, as broken as the model might be. And so the idea that you would then be creating something that ostensibly impacts one person or is impacting necess not necessarily anyone except the individual artist who's making that work, is that, is that enough in this moment for us as a field to, to go out there and say, like, this is what we're doing to all of those people who don't believe in, in the organizations and the institutions? Well, I think in order to hit certain narrow areas of, you know, a city, a group, or whatever, you have to be willing to say, I'm not trying to hit the masses. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to be willing to say, I can't, you know, and that if we can work in some of these micro ways, that's also very helpful. And I think that what some of the public art people have been trying to do is really to target, you know, you target to the people you want to talk to mm. also. Right. And sometimes you can't talk to everybody. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's just like not everybody can like your artwork. And, you know, you just have to accept that. So. I think we have time for one question if there's someone who has it. <laughs> Oops, sorry, we talked too long. So there, we need to get the microphone because we are live streaming this. So, um, Caleb, can you just bring it down front here? Thank you. Thanks, Caleb. Thank you. Uh, Nori, this question is for you. Um, and it's about the process of selecting art for a project. And my question is whether the process that is has been developed over this period of time um, prevents the, the acquisition or the commissioning of art that's politically sensitive. And that if because of that process there are issues that just never get raised. And for example, could you imagine a work by Carol Walker being in the public? Or, and as a corollary to that, has public art just given this up and turned it over and said, these issues belong only in a museum? Mm. Um, in some ways, yes. I think the public art world has really kind of rounded all corners, you know, in this desire to um, be accepted. And I think that that is a problem. But I do think that art that comes, even if it's difficult, 
if it comes from the conversations with the community and you know people are have kind of um, not like bought in I don't because I hate that term but if there is something that is difficult that comes out from conversations and research and makes sense then I think it totally could happen out in the public but the problem is this imposition of something that has nothing to do with people or that the people are afraid of um, coming that makes it really hard to do some of those the difficult subjects so-called because the other aspect of public art is that there's this feeling that it has to be accepted by everyone so if you do a Kara Walker piece and people are worried about sex or slavery or you know that offends them then one person complaining to the mayor is like all it takes right. to get rid of it so there, it is a process that's definitely broken I'm not sure how to fix it exactly but um, you know maybe what we need to do is say okay public art is one kind of thing it doesn't have to encompass everything the museum is another kind of thing it doesn't have to encompass everything and maybe we're just demanding um, too much I don't know I think there's it's interesting when you talk about public art you know we in our most recent issue of arts link there's an article about black lives matter and about the art that mm -hmm. came out of Ferguson particularly but about, has come out of that movement and continues to come out of that movement and um, a lot of those pieces are, I mean, pieces that were installed in public. There are pieces that are performed in public. There are actually pieces that, that lose a lot of their impact if they're not there in public. Mm -hmm. um, and I, so I'd, I'd love to understand from you, or from any of, any of you, is that, I, I mean, new is silly to say, is that something that is, is um, becoming more prevalent now, a, a kind of uh, more active desire to utilize at least part of our artistic spectrum to voice, Angelique, what you were talking about, this moment that we're in and, and what, I mean, that's the part that gives me, I think, actually the most hope is seeing the pieces that are emerging out of that and, and hearing about the poetry and the paintings and the sculptures that are coming out of all of the pain that this country is feeling right now. And, and I, I just find there's something very important about that in this conversation. Mm -hmm. And then I think, James, to your point, there's something uh, problematic about the fact that I imagine many of those artists feel entirely disenfranchised by our institutional system. But I think, so I mean, okay, I, I think most art is public. I think the problem is, I think that we should take advantage of the moment in time, a lot of what you were talking about, that even maybe started with the, um, Occupy Wall Street folks mm -hmm. with the reframing of language. If 99% of the country is not the 1% of the country, or if 98% of our art institutions are not the 2% of the institutions, why do we refer to the 1% and the 2% as the mainstream? Yeah. Right. Do you know what I mean? If most people are not actually working and operating within that structure of the tiny economic lead, why is that the mainstream? And I think that that's a big thing to rethink about. Like, actually, where is the positional power? And it's, it's so, I mean, you know, it's. To use a horrible analogy, if those of you who are dog owners, when you take your dog for a flea dip, you, know, you dip them in a big thing of um, poison, before the fleas die, they go crazy, and your dog is going to get bit worse than it's ever been bit before because the fleas are trying as hard as possible to survive. The optimist in me believes that the 2% is trying as hard as possible to survive right now. And so in some ways, the tension we're feeling is the actual reality of the world ultimately is changing. That's the optimist in me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who's the fleas and who's the dogs, but you feel right. me. Cool. They're That's the cool. fleas, I guess. Okay, they're the fleas. Okay. That's cool. All right. <laughs> so so we've we've come to the end of our time. I just wanted to to kind of <laughs> flea dips. <laughs> if you leave with one thing, it is that your dog will get bit worse than ever <laughs> if you dip them in a flea dip. Um, so, so the reason that we tried to put this together this year is that um, this is one part of a very complicated conversation that's going to occur in six different pre-conference events with nearly 500, 600 people, and then in a main convention that spans 40-some breakout sessions and whatever. And, and it's important that we all be having this conversation together and having it in groups of two and three and having it at receptions and having it in sessions. And so my hope 
is that this has probably not given you any answers at all, but has instead started you thinking about how you might go and solve some of that problem, some of, have some of that conversation. So um, I just want to say thank you very much to these four people. This is a very brave thing to do. This is a very hard conversation. So can we give them a big round of applause? For Yay, thank you.